Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for joining us for a discussion this afternoon about Florida's water future. There is probably no more important issue for us to figure out as Floridians than water. It impacts every uh, part of our life, from our agriculture industry to our needs at home uh, to our future economic development. And we have a great uh, lineup of a panel of experts to talk about the different facets of Florida's long-term water needs and policy. Um, we have a lot of different needs as we look across the state, everything from Everglades restoration to um, how do we store more of a, the 55 inches of rainfall we're blessed to have every year, to the water war that's going on in the panhandle with Georgia and Alabama that's impacting Apalachicola Bay. And if you love Appalachia oysters, you probably know about how severe that situation is becoming. So in a little while, um, my friend David Childs is going to introduce the panel, but there's two things that I'm going to do to kick us off here today. And one is um, I'm going to introduce my friend Matt Caldwell in a minute, who's become a real expert on water and worked on the Everglades Restoration Act, the Everglades Forever Act. But we came across a news clip recently that I wanted to show you. Um, no doubt all of you have followed the national news of just how severe the water crisis is in California. And I had the good fortune to take a trip early this summer to California to meet with uh, my colleagues at the California Chamber of Commerce. And it was a pretty enlightening couple of days. And while we were in Sacramento, I woke up one morning to uh, have a cup of coffee and I decided, you know, I'm going to go I'm going to go check out the California Capitol. I love politics. I love history. And so I walked across the street to walk around California's, quite frankly, lovely capital. It's modeled after the U.S. Capitol. And um, as I approached their grounds, I was a little struck. By the way, this was only in early July, the first week of July. So this was, you know, several months ago now, and the situation's only gotten worse. But as I walked across the street and onto their lawn, I noticed the entire lawn around the California Capitol was not grass, didn't look anything really like the Florida Capitol. The lawn instead was sort of a scorched earth of a mixture of sawdust and pine straw because their water situation had become so challenging. And again, that was the first week of July. So what I hope to show in this three little three-minute snippet we came across was how important and precious water is and what it, no one would argue that Florida has the kind of drought situation that they have in California but I think when you see this story you'll be struck as I was about how important it is to plan um, for the day when it's not a rainy day and how we don't want to follow the path of California of not preparing ourselves and so I'm particularly pleased that we have leaders in the legislature coming in to Senate President Andy Gardner and Speaker Chris Afuli who have said water's going to be our number one priority for the next two years. And certainly uh, Adam Putnam, who's been a voice on the importance of a long-term water supply plan for several years. So, Blake, could we show this? Summer may be winding down, but Southern California is suffering from a triple-digit heat wave that's expected to continue right through this weekend. That's bad news when extreme drought already affects more than 80% of the state, and a new study warns that California could be facing a 30-year mega drought, posing unprecedented challenges to water resources. Brandon Scott reports from one town where water is already in dangerously short supply. In California's relentless drought, Porterville is ground zero, a small town in the state's Central Valley where an entire neighborhood is without running water. What's it like for you when you turn on that faucet and no water comes out? It's very scary, very, very scary. The faucets in Kayla Hobbs' house stopped working last month after the well in her backyard dried out. It's very heartbreaking because we don't have any water period and, you know, we need water and everything that we do. She fills bottles at her mother's house across town, but it's not enough. I can't bathe my son, I can't do my laundry, I can't cook, I can't do nothing. 
Hobbs lives in a low income neighborhood where homes aren't connected to the town's water system. Instead, they rely on private wells. Many of these wells depend on groundwater from the Thule River, but due to the drought, this river is all but dry, and the wells it's supposed to replenish are running empty. Now, almost 300 households don't have water. You don't realize how much you need the water until this happens. It's awful. Mary Mejia's family survives on water from this tank delivered by the county. Their well ran dry three months ago. Every night we take a bucket of this and each of the girls take a shower with one bucket. And you would never believe you're going to be living out of a water tank. The county has set up several of these tanks, but officials caution it's merely a short-term remedy. The longer-term solution would be to develop some sort of community water distribution systems, but that's probably at least three years off. Another solution? Drill deeper wells. But at a cost of up to $30,000, most of these low-income residents can't afford it. They're living mostly paycheck to paycheck. A lot of them are on some sort of um, assistance, and so they just don't have the resources to, to go out and drill a new well. Let's give him a large pack and a single pack. So to help, volunteers like Donna Johnson collect water donations. Every day, she drives from house to house, bringing bottles to her neighbors, even though her well is dry too. This drought is kind of like a silent killer. You know, people look at you and you go, oh, that's too bad. It doesn't register on them how serious it is. A serious problem that until it rains will only get worse. For CBS This Morning Saturday, Brandon Scott, Porterville, California. I don't know if that strikes any of you the way it struck me when I saw that a few weeks ago on a Saturday morning, but I immediately... Uh, sat up and I said we've got to show that clip at the future of Florida forum because that really frames just how serious this issue is and it makes me think two things one we should pray for the citizens of California and two we should prepare to make sure that never happens to Florida um, so next I want to introduce my friend Matt Caldwell uh, Matt and I got to know each other um, when I lived in Lee County and we worked on a lot of cool things together back in those days, and it was no surprise to me that uh, he decided to run for the Florida House. Um, <clears throat> what actually did surprise me was something I learned preparing to introduce you. I, I didn't know you were a seventh generation Floridian. I thought I was the uh, most generations. I'm a sixth generation Floridian. I finally met someone who uh, has me beat, so congratulations on that, Matt. But he's a lifelong resident of Lee County, and he and his wife and daughter live in Lehigh Acres. Um, he went to school at Edison State College and uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. He was first elected to the Florida House in 2010 and kind of quickly made himself uh, an expert on water policy. Um, he has chaired the House Agriculture and Na Agricultural and Natural Resources Committee uh, the last two years. And as I said, he was the author and sponsor of the uh, Everglades Forever Act, but he also uh, helped out on uh, championing local pension reform, which was something, Matt, we talked about in the earlier session, and we very appreciate, very much appreciate your leadership on that. But since you're here to talk about water today, let me bring you up, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the, uh, the kind words, and uh, you know, I won't make any comment about our age difference and that generational gap there between the two of us. Um, so it struck me when I was thinking about, uh, we're, we're here at the future of Florida, uh, here in central Florida, and um, I just uh, celebrated my 33rd birthday about a month and a half ago, and my grandfather and I share the same birthday. That's the side that has all those generations. Uh, he just turned 80 this year. And so uh, it made me think about the Florida he was born into just up the road here in Wildwood in 1934. Uh, when he was a child, he helped pick watermelons where uh, retirees play golf at the villages today. Uh, his, his Florida had about one and a half million people in it. And we're going to clock into the 20 million person mark uh, definitely within this decade, I expect. And uh, at least within my vision, I bet we'll hit the 25 million, if not more. Uh, that's pretty impressive when you think about in less than a century how many people we have added to this state, how much this state has changed, uh, I think on net for the better, uh, but it's brought some, some challenges. And I thought I'd start by talking about 
kind of the big four challenges I see when we talk about water policy today. Uh, and uh, David uh, hit on those kind of briefly already, but uh, the Apalachicola is definitely a major part of that. And uh, th there's no doubt that uh, the bounty of that estuary system uh, has been something we pr prided ourselves on in Florida for a very long time. And its potential loss and, and possible closure this fall is a real blow, uh, at, at the very least emotionally, uh, but also certainly economically to the folks in that region. Uh, the other problems you, you heard plenty about this last year, and that's the springs. Uh, now, springs is a pretty big and nebulous issue. We've got uh, several hundred when you talk about all of them, but definitely a couple dozen first magnitude, the gems that uh, everyone thinks about when they think of springs, uh, the ones that people drive, from, drive and fly from across the world to come visit. Uh, the Everglades, uh, nobody could miss that. Uh, good grief, as I said, I, I hit my 33rd year uh, this year, and I've spent my entire life listening to the argument about the Everglades. Uh, growing up in Southwest Florida, you couldn't miss it. Everything, uh, politics from running for dog catcher all the way to governor, is influenced in some way in South Florida uh, by the Everglades. Uh, and then lastly, what's a really critical issue, particularly here in Central Florida, is groundwater discussions. Uh, how much do we have uh, until we've used up too much for all that bountiful growth we've experienced? So if we view these as problems, uh, I've got to ask myself, where do they come from? Uh, how did they happen? Did they just fall out of the sky, or is there something else there? And uh, I think you've seen me already set the stage for it. Uh, they didn't fall out of the sky. It's us. Uh, those 20 million people that live, live here uh, and have made a successful life and career here are part of the reason the state has changed. I mean, fundamentally, you can't have a place fill up with 20 million people and expect it to look and feel and function the way it did when none of us are here. And what does that mean? Uh, well, we asked for it. Uh, we, a state, as a public policy from the very first day we became a state in 1845, begged the federal government to give us control of all of that land we had just won from the Seminoles in the Second Seminole War. All that land from Ocala uh, to the Everglades, to the Sawgrass. All this land we sit in right now was federal. And we said, please, please give it to us. And we will make good use of it. And that's what, from the perspective of the policymakers of the time, and, and still broadly, I think, we would recognize we've done. We've filled it with people. We've, we've built the places we're in right now. And we've made a success, for it, success out of it from a financial perspective. Uh, same thing when you talk about springs. Um, there are a lot of springs that are in good shape and safe, and that's because we've either bought them, uh, put them in the public trust, uh, put them uh, away from immediate impacts, uh, maybe some long-term concerns we have to think about groundwater, uh, but by and large, the, the ones in the north central section uh, aren't really in the crisis like we have the ones here in central Florida. And those we've just loved to death. I mean, we built our houses right on top of them, we've drained into them, we've pumped the groundwater out from underneath them. Uh, it's no surprise, then, that they don't look and function uh, like they did before any of us got here and started to spend all of our time uh, making them the uh, tourist attraction we wanted them to be. And then the Apalachicola, I mean, this is, this is one uh, that just, uh, I shake my head. Uh, September 17th, for you all that don't uh, recollect, is Constitution Day, and I end up going and talking uh, to classes this, this uh, past couple weeks, probably about three or 400 kids I've talked to about the Constitution. We take it, open it up, read the preamble, get into the, the powers of the federal government, and, and I get to Section 8 and talk about the enumerated powers, the things that the federal government is supposed to do. And one of my friends joked that I'm, I'm really just setting those kids up for heartache. They'll realize it doesn't really work that way anymore. Um, but when I look at that, and then I look at a problem like Apalachicola, which is undeniably an issue that we desperately need federal leadership on, and they really don't provide any. This is an interstate conflict between three states that it, it's never going to be resolved by litigating it against each other. Fundamentally, we have to have leadership at the federal level, and we've got good, uh, good people in our congressional delegation that care about this, but I mean from the top down as a major priority of the United States government. That problem needs their leadership. It is interstate. It is their fundamental responsibility to figure out those kind of conflicts between states. We're not getting it today. I've got two questions. They're just, they're, they're not, uh, I don't want to raise of hands. I just want you to, to in your gut, uh, think to yourself what your answer would be. Um, probably going to get in a little trouble for asking these questions, but I think it's serious and worth considering. Uh, two things. One, 
does anybody really believe in their gut that if the EPA is able to get full control and sovereignty all of our water from drop of the sky till it hits the ocean, that we will actually have better water quality and better quality of life as a result? Just truly in your gut, do you think that things will get better if they have full and total control over the water policy? The second question I have is, uh, in 2001, uh, we signed the state and the federal government a cooperative agreement to restore the Everglades. The entire project is about a $10 billion project. Do you really believe in your gut that they're going to actually give us $5 billion when it's all said and done? So just, again, no show of hands. Think about both of those for a minute. So the question is, we've got these problems. Where do they come from? Uh, we know fundamentally these are problems of our own creation. Uh, victims of our own success in many ways. And so if we're going to solve them, from my perspective, we are the ones that are going to have to make them better. Uh, we're not going to be able to wait for anybody else to show up and fix those things. Uh, when we had a surface water crisis in the 1970s, the state answered that. The water management districts are a creation of a surface water management issue. And I would say today we don't have surface water in terms of allocation crises. Uh, maybe somebody could argue that's why we're talking about groundwater crises potentially now. But the fact is that when it came time to solve a surface water issue, the state did step up to the plate and took care of that problem. And you look at that SERP project, $10 billion commitment, $5 billion from the state, $5 billion from the feds. The only project that's been completed 13 years on is the state project in the Fagahatchee, down in the Golden Gate, South Golden Gate section, all the acquisitions south by 75. That's a huge success. And you look at uh, the other things that we have been attacking in terms of the policy in that region, whether it's bridging US 41, putting money for the first time ever towards uh, the two reservoirs on each coast, uh, the real progress you see made in the Everglades is coming out of the state legislature. And I'm going to tell you that's probably for the future going to be where it's going to come from. But here's, here's the last point and kind of the, the, the tee up I want to give you as we get to these four people that are going to talk about this. Um, we are, we the legislators, 120 of us in the House, uh, are just a reflection of you all. Uh, we, are, we are not uh, endowed with some incredible knowledge and wisdom from uh, down from the mountains at Zeus. Uh, we are looking uh, for answers the same as you are. Sometimes we do have pretty good ideas and it does help uh, that we get to bounce them off each other on a regular basis. Uh, but you're here today because you're leaders in your specific area in this state. And so uh, I've outlined some of the problems I see, but I need you to tell me if I miss some. Things that you think are critical and if we don't address them now in the next three to five years, uh, it's going to be a disaster for the state. And I've outlined who I think is going to be the leader on that. Ultimately, it's going to be the state. But if you think I'm wrong on that, give me some more thoughts on those things. Uh, I can tell you that at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to be accomplished. None of the progress will happen by being divisive and fighting each other within the state. Uh, we have to have a unified policy front in order to achieve these goals. And uh, that's what I hope uh, we'll be able to do here in the next year. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Childs who's going to answer all those tough questions I've thrown out at him. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I try to make it a point not to uh, disagree with legislators in public, but I don't have all the answers, so I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and in fact, I'm not going to be giving many of the answers. The fine uh, gentleman to my left uh, will be the, the one. So see, I can, I can throw you all under the bus just like uh, I just got thrown under. Uh, we've got three, three great experts, Jeff Little, John Ernie Cox, and Grover Robinson, Commissioner Robinson, uh, that are going to really peel back a few more layers of the young in here and talk about some of these issues. Um, uh, you know, we're so, <laughs> when, it's funny, uh, David Hart saw that video and he was, you know, being who he is, you know, his heart went out to the California, the folks in California. He was um, thinking about them and what we needed to be doing here in the state to avoid those problems. I was just thinking, man, I'm glad I live in Florida. I mean, I have that, uh, half the, the news programs I see uh, focusing on other areas of the country, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking in the back of my head. Um, but you know, we, we do have some, some looming challenges here in the state. 
Uh, in the next 15 to 20 years, we're going to have another 6 million Floridians that are going to live here. Uh, we already are seeing some signs of strain in our water resources. We have limitations in the, uh, in the, in the southwest region of the state, in the, the SWACA, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, the water, southern water use uh, caution area. We have uh, projected limitations in central Florida for groundwater usage. And we have some information coming out from the Suwannee and St. John's River Water Management Districts that even in north central Florida that there, we may be essentially at our limit as far as traditional water supplies. So my, my first question will be, you know, how can we avoid a situation in the next 15 to 20 years uh, where we're not confronted with significant disputes amongst water users between public water supply utilities, agricultural interests, and other self-suppliers because we are tapped out of those traditional water supplies. So I'll, I'll first I'll have Ernie try to, uh, uh, to, to answer that one. You know, how do we avoid the woulda, shoulda, coulda uh, moment 15 years from now? Well, thank you. Uh, wow, that's loud. Um, turn me down just a little bit. I think one of, the, one of the key things we have to remember as Floridians is that we have a dramatically different situation than they do in, in California. Uh, and if you look at planning for the future, planning for another 6 million people, planning for another 10 million people, the further you go out, what we've really got to start doing is looking at planning for those water resource projects. Um, and I think there's a pretty strong acknowledgement around the state that our traditional sources uh, are either limited currently or will be limited during that time period. Um, and so I, rather than reinventing the wheel from the very beginning, uh, we can look at some good work that was done previously. Uh, Senate Bill 444 uh, passed a number of years ago was a coordinated effort by a lot of different people from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, to focus on alternative water supply development. Uh, and when you talk about who are you developing alternative water supplies for, I think it's critically important to understand that you've got to provide water for the people that live and work here. You've got to provide water for the people and the businesses that we're hoping to attract here. You've got to provide water for the agricultural industry uh, that is a backbone of our economy. And you've got to provide water for our natural systems. Um, and any time that balance gets out of whack, we're going to have problems. Uh, so as we go forward to develop this strategy, um, we've got to look at a balance between all of the users. Um, now, of course, everybody has their lobby groups that work on their own issue. I'm a firm believer that that's okay. Uh, and the best way to reach balance is to get a lot of different perspectives in the room and say, listen, we're going to have at it. We're going to go back and forth and we're going to argue. At the end of the day, we've got to come up with a solution. Uh, it doesn't help us if we have a whole lot of people sitting in a room and they all have the same idea. Uh, so I'm okay with that conflict. It's a messy process, but the more that you can get good policy people together to look at the balance of those needs, the better we're going to be. Uh, and then the other part of it is quite simply funding. You, you can have the best water policy in the state dealing with water quality, water quantity, distribution, et cetera. But if you don't have consistent funding, you're not going to get it done. Um, I, I've heard it said a lot of times that the, the days of cheap water in Florida are over. Um, California has the days of very expensive water, and yet they're still running out of water. Um, we're going to have to get over that a little bit, realize that we've got to make very significant investments in our water supply projects um, across the board. Uh, last thing on that point that I think is very, very important. As we're developing alternative water supply projects, and we're thinking about that balance between the different interests, to the extent that we can come up with projects that are funded that accomplish multiple objectives, we're better able to leverage our funding. So just a quick for instance, if you were able to have a project that provides public water supply for people and businesses, and its source of water happens to be discharges that are going to tide, that are causing damage to estuaries. Um, and in the conveyance between the discharge and the user, you're able to rehydrate a natural system that uh, attracts wood storks and other endangered species. 
Well, guess what? You're leveraging those funds across three different interest groups in doing your project. So just an idea that as we start to think about our alternative water supply development and funding, to be holistic and understand the balance that has to exist between the water users. Well, and you mentioned funding. Uh, one of the items on the ballot uh, this upcoming November, excuse me, um, is the Amendment 1 Water and Land <laughs> Legacy Initiative, uh, which would set aside a third of dock stamp revenues um, for, excuse me, that's really annoying. Let me see if I can, hold on, improvise here. Okay, that's better. Um, the, uh, which would set aside a third of dock stamp revenues for the next 20 years for a laundry list of projects, uh, land and water uh, projects. The estimates are that in the first year it would set, a, set aside $648 million and by year 20 we'd be up to $1.2 billion set aside for everything from beach nourishment projects to working farms to the uh, management and restoration of watersheds. It's really, if you, it's interesting, if you read the text of the amendment, it is a very broadly drafted amendment. Um, but it does tie the hands of the legislature so that if there is a future crisis in the state, you know, they will be obligated via the state constitution uh, to dedicate funding to uh, those specific items and the percentages that are in there. So uh, my question to Jeff is just very simply, uh, should I be excited or upset about Amendment 1? Um, <clears throat> way to uh, hand off a, uh, a doozy for me for my first question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, in, in front of uh, Chairman Caldwell, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and say, double down on David's comments about uh, uh, opposing it for uh, the reasons he said. Uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of the amendment because it does tie the hands uh, of the legislature. And I think that. Um, uh, in, in, a, in a future constrained budget environment, uh, you know, they, they've got a very challenging job to do to balance all of these competing uh, interests in the state, uh, you know, from education to health care to, uh, to, to first responders and basic public safety, and, uh, and to take this amount of money off the top and just say you can't touch this. Um, I just think we're, we're on a very slippery slope and we could all wake up, you know, 20 years from now if, in a future of more uh, uh, budget amendments or constitutional amendments and budget referendums by, by uh, uh, the people. And uh, we can end up with a situation like California where their legislature is, is very ill-equipped to solve their own budgetary problems uh, because there are so many special interests that have locked away certain uh, elements of their budget. Uh, however, um, I, I won't go all negative. I think that there are some um, there are some benefits uh, uh, to a steady funding supply uh, for 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 water infrastructure. Uh, Ernie alluded to the fact that you you really do need a stable uh, uh, funding mechanism to to get a lot of good work done in, in water infrastructure, water supply, and water water restoration. And I think that uh, having some stability in the marketplace. Uh, for, for funding that type of inf infrastructure will result in perhaps uh, private equity showing up and, and us seeing more uh, a rise in public-private partnerships that we've seen in transportation uh, projects, for example. I think that would be a very, a very great outcome of a, of a, of a stable uh, a source of funding year in and year out. Uh, I'd just rather not see it in the Constitution. Uh, if, if you missed the uh, news clips this morning, a chamber poll came out and it is polling at 75%. So that's a 15 point cushion uh, over the 60% needed to pass. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, rewind the clock to about 2010, uh, the BP oil spill. Uh, you know, uh, one of the, there weren't many highlights to that event, but if, there, if you could pick one, I would say when I, flipped it on Good Morning America and saw the morning newsman or the weatherman out there on the beach saying, usually this beach would be full of vacationers, but it's not because of this oil spill. And I, 
I can tell you, I've never been on Panama City Beach at, well, I've maybe never been on there at 7 a.m. in the morning. Usually I've just gone to bed, but I've never seen it crowded at 7 a.m. Uh, so that, uh, that disaster, uh, you know, there were at least a few uh, light moments that, that came out of it, at least for me, or really frustrating moments. Um, a couple years after the spill, the, the Restore Act passed. Um, and what I would like Commissioner Robinson to just simply answer is, where are we with the Restore Act and the funding? Well, thank you, and I, I do want to get into that. I, I think you'd ask us to first kind of introduce ourselves. I just was going to say thank you to the Chamber for at least at least hosting us and allowing uh, local government, the Florida Association of Counties, to be here. So we certainly appreciate that. I, I jokingly say I, I work for Bentina Terry. She's a constituent in, in Escambia County, so, uh, so I'm glad to see the good things that are going on with the foundation. We're certainly uh, uh, happy to be here. And I also want to say I'm a, also a seventh generation uh, Floridian, and my, my paternal grandmother was a Caldwell. So I don't know if somehow or another uh, that, that ties things together, but. Uh, but, but it, it, it certainly is a, um, glad to be here and a part of this discussion today. Uh, the Restore Act of Deepwater Horizon spill was dramatic. I think for all Floridians, I think um, it certainly hit us in Northwest Florida more dramatically and more directly. Uh, but I think it was an alarm bell to all Floridians about what happens with contamination. Um, we certainly, all of our water resources, whether they're salt water or fresh water, are important to us, and we're going to talk about that. But the risk of contamination, you had a chance to see how devastating that could be on the state and what might happen in a worst case scenario. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, we've done a lot, of, uh, a lot of repair, a lot of restoration, a lot of hard work, and we've been able to get, for the most part, uh, we believe most of, most of what happened out of there, and now we're able to focus on a silver lining, which is really restoration. Uh, I'm very proud to have been a part of the process. The Restore Act was really first of its kind, uh, very involved with both the drafting and actively uh, participating in the, uh, the advocacy for the act and getting it passed. Um, I think what's exciting about it is it's the first time ever in the U.S. history, of course it was the largest environmental ha uh, disaster, but that you're actually seeing fines come back to the states that were impacted. And we made a huge argument, um, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, in going to going to Congress and saying, listen, this devastated our areas and our coast. It was an environmental catastrophe that was beyond what we capably knew how to do. You know, this is great, it's going to the federal government, but some of this should come back to these various states. Florida has the opportunity through the passage of that act to see probably anywhere between 800 million and 2.5 billion dollars come back to the state of Florida to deal with restoration, both environmental and economic. There are five different components uh, to it, really three of which we focus on. Uh, we're very involved at the Florida Association of Counties. Uh, there's one component where the money will come directly back to those impacted counties uh, from Escambia to Monroe all along the Gulf Coast. So you will be seeing restoration projects occur all along Florida's Gulf Coast. There's also a component that comes to the state of Florida through the council. It is competitive. We're trying to put forward the best projects to put Florida uh, competitively to get funding for that. And then there's a third component uh, where about a third of the revenues come into, there's a formula. Uh, Florida expects to see about 20 percent of that, one-fifth of that, uh, that component. And we, uh, we, we are uh, the, it calls for a, a body of the local consortia, so it's, uh, it's 23 members of the individual counties that are on the Gulf, and we are in partnership with the state and the governor, uh, has six appointees on that board. Uh, we've been meeting almost every other month for a couple of years, and we're excited to see the Treasury rules are just coming forward, so money will begin to flow. It is very important, uh, I think, for, for both that environmental and uh, economic restoration that we saw uh, really occur. Again, I, I can't say enough of, 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 I think it exposes the danger of water, what happens if you get contamination. It is very difficult uh, to uncouple yourself and it becomes a, uh, just as much of a horror story that you saw the individuals who couldn't get water. Uh, when you have contaminated water, whether it's salt water estuaries or your fresh water, um, it, it becomes a significant impact on business, quality of life, and, and, and really the future of Florida. So it is very important uh, that we make sure that we do the right things to protect our, our, our water, whether it's estuarial or um, our, our fresh water groundwater. 
Okay, now I have more questions to ask, but now that everyone's had an a opportunity to, to speak here, I also want to open up to the, the audience. I'm going to keep going, but if you have any questions for any of our panelists, uh, just raise your hand or, or, sh or shout from your table, and, uh, and we, can, we can certainly field those as well. So uh, moving right along, I want to uh, touch on one of the issues that, that Chair Caldwell mentioned. Uh, last session, there was a uh, Springs bill, Senate Bill 1576, uh, that uh, passed the, the Senate unanimously, but was, was not considered by the House. And it had uh, in it some policy changes uh, to address uh, issues with springs, both in, both in terms of spring flow in spring water quality. Um, it had uh, a funding uh, mechanism in it, uh, at least at, at one time it did, by the time it had worked its way through the process that it, that it essentially uh, gone away uh, because the, simply the, the, the aggressive kind of uh, money that was, was sought just simply wasn't there. Uh, so we had a springs bill last year we did have some, some significant funds still put towards springs restoration projects. And uh, the Department and Department of, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services has taken the, the 20 million that was allocated by the legislature and managed to use local programs to fund over $100 million of projects. So some, some significant projects are being implemented now to protect springs. But Jeff, when it comes to what's needed for springs protection and restoration, is it a question of policy development? Is it a question of implementation of existing policies? Or is it more of appropriations to fund projects? All right, so that's your two for two for nice, easy softballs. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jeff Littlejohn, and, uh, and I think the reason he's asking me this is I was uh, Deputy Secretary of DEP over the regulatory programs for, for three and a half years. And so he's wondering if this can be, if we can regulate all of our solutions uh, to, to Springs restoration. And I think the answer is no. Um, uh, Chair Caldwell uh, gave that example of, uh, of EPA top-down approach uh, to solving water quality challenges. And I, and I think that they would fail miserably. I'll go ahead and answer the, that question and, and cast my vote. Uh, because I think top-down approaches um, tend to, to always come with unintended consequences and tend to always uh, cost a lot more than, than, the, uh, than the correct solution uh, would, would cost. Um, a perfect example, in, uh, just to illustrate the, the fallacy that top-down approaches, is EPA uh, at the height of the numeric nutrient criteria debate with the state. Uh, they have a, a numeric nutrient criteria website on the national EPA uh, webpage that they've, they've since uh, changed, but they had a, a photograph from uh, a Florida nature photographer, Thomas Moran, of, of the Santa Fe River. And he kind of famously kayaks it every year and takes pictures of, of algae, algae blooms and then publishes them and that stirs up all the environmental uh, sentiment surrounding nutrient pollution. And EPA happened to, to, to take that photograph and post it on their, their national website. And at the height of the debate, uh, we pointed out, and I, I relished uh, the opportunity, so they let me do it, um, that, uh, that by the federal standards, that water body was healthy that it actually was using the state numeric nutrient criteria that would have deemed that water body unhealthy and a target for, for restoration. And so that's that top-down, one-size-fits-all approach that, that, that fails to recognize the diversity of, of nature. And it takes a, it takes a local solution. And, and we were advocating for the state knows better than the federal government how to manage and, and uh, regulate and restore and preserve and protect uh, Florida's own waters. And so, if, if I'm intellectually consistent, I would say a top-down, a top state regulatory-driven approach probably isn't the right solution when you're a local government and, and the problem is in your own backyard. So I'm, I'm in favor of, uh, of, uh, of putting the solutions into the hands of those best equipped and able to uh, uh, make, affect the changes. And, and so, um, uh, I think that regulatory policies 
uh, should have a balance of carrots and sticks. And, and there are plenty of regulations that, that act as those sticks on local governments and on individual permit holders to ensure that, uh, that those permits, those permit holders don't contribute to water quality challenges. Um, I think that there are, there are enough sticks in existing state regulations to, uh, to encourage and promote uh, uh, restoration of water bodies over time, including when it comes from non-traditional sources, and, and I mean non-conventionally non regulated sources. And so let me go to the heart of the issue, septic tanks. Uh, so that tends to blow these types of, of, uh, of bills up is when uh, we start talking about a state law that it impacts somebody's septic tank in their own backyard. Uh, I think that the the correct uh, uh, balance of that tough issue is when you impose a regulatory burden on a group of people that surround a water body that's impaired. And the state has a process to, to do that. It takes them years and they do the science and they do the cause and effect relationships and they identify uh, uh, how much of the contribution may come from septic tanks and how much comes from other sources and everybody is asked to to kind of pull their own weight and that's where I think the state has a real opportunity if it if it starts to provide some carrots and I think with uh, uh, with with uh, getting folks connected uh, that have septic tanks getting them connected to sewer uh, that costs a lot of money and that's where I think where state funding can can play a large role into solving these problems but, uh, but it's going to take it's going to take time. It, it took us many many decades uh, for some of these water bodies to get in the health and the state they are now, the poor health that they are now. And it will take many many decades uh, to to see their full recovery. But I think it is possible. So so besides uh, to sum up, I think we've got to to have a balanced approach of of regulatory tools and incentives. And I think we have to to the extent that we can, we need to uh, implement smart regulatory policies that align themselves with market forces. And what I mean by that is, again, once again, uh, that top-down kind of mentality that, that sometimes can come from government uh, and, you know, invariably results in some unintended consequences. But if, you, if the government can establish the restoration targets and then let uh, local partners, local advocates, local stakeholders work together and solve problems, I think they'll get to the solutions faster. And, and what I mean by aligning themselves with the marketplaces is, is, is when those very cheap sources of groundwater uh, become less available, uh, the, the price will go up. And so alternative water supply will become more economical. And when the cost of restoration starts to be imposed in, in economic decisions, then the cost of avoiding those impacts is going to start to get factored into our decision making at the, at the local level, whether it's a zoning decision or whether it's a permitting decision. So uh, I, I think that uh, the, the policies and the regulatory tools in place are, are absolutely uh, adequate and effective. And uh, I think we just need to not uh, Kind of, kind of go to our tendency to want to over, you know, over-regulate and solve this problem through, uh, through regulation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Robinson. I, I would just like to, to uh, join in with my fellow panelists up here, and I said that's something that, that the Florida Association of Counties would greatly um, appreciate and, and believes there that the the ultimate issue is the one-size-fits-all water policy doesn't work. I mean, in, in septic tank, the, 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 the law we saw happen where, and certainly it, it may work in, in areas where there are issues right around this area, and I would totally support that for those counties that have that experience, but in my county uh, the septic tank issue was, was, was ended up, you were impacting people severely for something that they would never end up happening. So I think much of what the association would agree with is to work some way with water across the state in a way that recognizes the different regional differences that we may have from the topography we have and the various sources of water. Uh, we think that that's going to make one thing complex to Florida, but we would certainly welcome that in a partnership with the state uh, to be able to work that out. The, the, and, and we believe that would be best also for the businesses and the citizens across the state uh, be much more effective in getting the desired results. So we would echo that. The other thing I cannot say enough, and I appreciate the comments, and I don't know how much it, of it's heard by everyone out there, uh, but in, in my, my other uh, dual life, um, I'm a commercial real estate broker. In fact, I was a former, uh, one time when I 
had my own firm. I was, I was a former member of the Florida Chamber. Uh, but uh, but I, I've often said at our level, um, when we deal with zoning complexes, that there are way too many sticks and not enough carrots. If you want the private sector to build what you want to build, you can't stick them to death. You've got to carrot them, and you will find out that you will produce a lot of more exactly what you want to do. But we have our rules so messed up at all levels of government. Um, if we can find ways to create more carrots, we will get more things the, the way that we want to do. And that doesn't, that's not just at the state, that is at every level of government. We've got to find a way to put more carrots into what we want to do and, and that would, we would find ourselves actually producing something uh, that, that, that we really want, whether it's through development regulations, whether it's water uh, uh, regulations that are being talked about here. I cannot say that is such a nuance that, that can get lost uh, because we tend to be so stick oriented. Uh, I, I can't say enough about carrot oriented policy. Okay, sure, go ahead, Jeff. I, uh, if I follow, I promise I'll keep it short because uh, I w went way over my time. So when I say carrot, I don't just mean money. So, uh, uh, Chairman, please don't think I'm out here just spending the people's money talking about uh, carrots and incentives. Um, carrots. Okay, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I wrote it down. Carrots can come in the form of, of regulatory incentives as well, so non-monetary non incentives. And an example would be uh, rewarding a local government that has a strong conservation program in place and invests in, in water conservation with longer consumptive use permit durations. Uh, and, and not just benefiting local governments that way, but benefiting landowners and ben benefiting industry as well. So uh, creating uh, enough regulatory room to maneuver so that the right types of behaviors take place and you don't clamp everybody down with the same regulations. And, and certainly I, I didn't take it to mean you were going to give money. I, I, what I think of is uh, in development if you want sidewalks then give somebody the ability to, to uh, have more density if they put in things of sidewalks, things that are non-monetary, just the things that you're saying. Uh, when I say carrot, I agree with you. It doesn't have to be monetary, but it has to be something that incents the behavior of what you want to achieve. That's much better than telling somebody you're going to club them over the head. Right, and certainly on the uh, septic tank issue, it's, it's, it's very challenging to, to deal with with septic tanks, you know, where there are, where there does seem to be a link between cluster developments on septic tanks and, and water quality. If you, if you read the various versions of the Senate bill as it went through the process, it's actually, it's very interesting to look at each version as it went through each committee. Uh, because it started off with, the state's gonna pay for the hookups. Don't worry about it, we'll identify those, those areas that need to be hooked up and the state will, will foot the bill. Maybe that's a good thing the state foots the bill. Maybe it's a bad thing as a matter of policy, but that's what it said. Then as it went and, and, and got to the end of the process to where there was uh, no longer the funding for the state to pay, then there was still the mandate for hookups. Uh, there was still the, the language that the homeowner would not foot the bill, but there was no longer the language that protected the local government that says, we're not going to make you do this unless there is state funding. So what you were left with was you would, you would be forcing the local government utility rate payers to subsidize the hookups of septic tanks, uh, which, you know, again, you can, you, can, you can form your own opinions about whether or not that makes sense to do it that way. Uh, so the who pays question is really one of the most difficult ones when it comes to septic tanks because we're not just talking about an environmental issue, we're also talking about a socioeconomic issue too. And you know, I may be able to, to fund the, the $5,000 hookup if I was on a septic tank and it was a line out there and I, I needed to, uh, to do the hookup. I wouldn't like to, to pay that out of pocket, but I could. But the guy working at Wendy's flipping burgers, there's no way. Uh, so there's, that's a really difficult issue, and I, I don't know if anyone else, I'm sorry, I got a little bit on the soapbox there, I know I'm just the moderator, uh, but uh, maybe there's, uh, maybe someone else on the panel has some thoughts on that issue. Well, you know, it, it, and uh, I'm a firm believer in you, you got to address it up front. It's an issue, uh, and depending on where you are, it, it's an issue or it's not an issue. If you have a home on 100 acres, 20 miles from the nearest estuary or water source or water body, you know what, your septic tank may be just fine. 
Um, if your backyard has a septic tank in it and you're right next to an estuary, guys, you flush the toilet, it's gonna be in the estuary. Simple, simple as the way it is. So we, we've gotta address it legislatively with an ability, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but say, okay, let's give those local governments, the elected officials, some tools to use. Let's give them some guidelines that come with funding. We've done this before. If you drop back and look at the original concurrency law, came with a funding source. Uh, it was an extraordinarily unpopular funding source, the uh, tax on services, and it was rescinded uh, the very next session. But the funding source to pay for concurrency in roads and parks, et cetera, was part of the original growth management legislation. You can't do this without a funding source. If there's gonna be a requirement, there's a funding source. The piece that I'd like to see, and I think we've got enough smart people in the state, enough smart people in our local governments, to say, you know what guys, we're gonna address the issue. The issue is nitrates and other um, substances are getting into our water bodies. So if it's not a problem in a particular area, there's no need to go fix it. That particular area may have an issue somewhere else that we could help fix. But in those areas where there's a problem, let's look at a coordinated approach that says local government, if you've got a problem, you need to put it into your capital improvements plan over time. Simple as that. Second, the state's gonna help you. Um, because if you start to look at reducing the impact in an estuary or a river or a lake, it's easiest if you can address that impact close to its source. Uh, and so instead of building a multi-million dollar stormwater treatment area to treat it downstream, let's work on it up front. And I'd be willing to bet you can go to any county in the state and they've got a list of where they're having issues. Uh, one example, somewhat unpopular in some communities, is that the, the town of Jupiter, the Loxhatchee River, and the, the Loxhatchee River Control District. Over the last 20 years, they have systematically taken neighborhoods that are on the river off of septic tanks. Um, and they've done it with a combination of, of direct payment, they've done it with a combination of uh, uh, funding over time, and they've done it with grants and, and funding. Um, I, the commissioner raises a real good point that works in just about every sense. If we want to deal with the impacts of septic tanks, so understand that if there's not an impact, you don't need to deal with it. If you want to deal with the impacts of septic tanks, provide a carrot funding, provide an incentive to help the local governments and the utilities deal with it, um, provide value to the landowner when they go to sell that home, um, because I can tell you right now, one of the checklists that people look at is, am I hooked up to public water and sewer, or am I on septic tank? And look at it in a holistic fashion, but geographically limited. Tallahassee doesn't need to say, everybody has to do it this way, because you know what? What may work in Escambia County may not work in Martin County. What may work in Monroe County may not work in Polk County. Um, so, but I think, guys, we can't, we can't ignore the septic tank issue throughout the state. And I, I, I'm, I'm from South Florida, so I've mentioned estuaries and, and lakes. Uh, if you're in the central, north central, it springs. But guys, we gotta deal with them. Okay, uh, shifting gears just a little bit. One of, the, one of the issues that was mentioned before was, uh, you know, what, what kind of non-economic incentives uh, can we develop as a state to promote water restoration, creation of, of water supply? Uh, one issue that has been a hot topic lately is something called dispersed water storage. Um, sometimes it's referred to as water farming. Basically what this is, for those of you uh, that don't know, this is if you have a landowner, uh, generally an agricultural operation, they set aside some, some land on their property that they use for water retention, water, excuse me, water retention or water treatment. Uh, and presently, uh, they're compensated quite often for that, it's taking land out of production, they're having a, a general benefit uh, my question for the group is, you know, one, what role do you see dispersed water storage playing in, in addressing Florida's water supply and water quality challenges? And, and two, aside from compensating landowners for si setting aside property, uh, are there other incentives that you think should be available to promote people using their land in this way that is to the, the benefit of the state at large? So I'll, I won't 
I won't call out anyone, but does anyone? Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot to begin with, but I, uh, let's go back and, and you've heard me say this a couple of times, uh, the balance. Think about your financial portfolio. Um, you've got a balance of things that are less expensive, more expensive. Everything we have to do has to be balanced. So if you think about Florida's water policy, Florida's water infrastructure, you've got water quantity, you've got water quality. Uh, my opinion, I think dispersed water management, dispersed water storage is, is a key part of that equation. Um, its strengths are uh, that you're, you're leaving the land in private ownership. You're providing an incentive for a private owner to hold more water on his or her property. And you're typically doing it at a relatively low cost. Um, drawbacks, it's probably not going to be useful for um, water supply in a drought, because if it's holding the water higher on a farm or a ranch or in a, in a system, uh, in a drought, there's not going to be water there. Um, but for dealing with excess discharges and dealing with water quality issues, particularly with nutrients, whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen, uh, it's a great, great tool. Uh, one of the things that I think we could, we could perhaps, as we go into the next generation of this, this idea, is to be a bit more strategic in the locations that we do it. Right now, it's, it's a program where we, we set aside an area, let's say the northern Everglades, Orlando down to Lake Okeechobee, and then we do an open RFP and people come in and bid on the project. Um, while there needs to be an open process, it may be that instead of putting 12 projects scattered around the map, we might get some added benefit if we put 12 projects right down one system. Um, and so as we evolve that program, um, and we, in my opinion, put some more funding into it, um, we perhaps could provide some additional incentive if you happen to be in an area that's been designated as one that needs extra attention. So to be a little bit more strategic perhaps be a lot more strategic in how we direct funding so that in those areas that we really want this program to be used because it has extra benefits for the public, you know what, they get bumped up the, bumped up the priority a little bit. I think that would, that would be helpful. Um, I, I would just say, well, if you hadn't already heard me enough here today, I'm more of a carrot guy, so I, I like anything that, that does that. I, I certainly agree with you. One of the interesting things about water is you can have too much water. Um, and, and what we're talking about with the, the increased storm cycles and variety, we're, we're starting to think, we got our mind thought on drought, but in Florida, I tell you, we could easily be the, the other way. And I just want to ex experience in my county, in April 29th, we received, in a 24-hour uh, time frame, we received 26 inches of rain. Um, now, I went in July to NACO, the National Association of Counties, and I talked with a good friend of mine from Colorado, and he was asking me about it because he saw it on there and all the flooding we had. I mean, if you remember, you saw five, what five inches did to Phoenix. Again, this was five times that amount. Um, and he, I asked him, I said, well, how much, how much rain do you get in Colorado in a year? And he said, in a year we get 13 inches. So on one night we had twice the annual rainfall uh, that they have in Colorado, and I can tell you it we, we were very fortunate we got a nas the disaster. I mean, it really clobbered our infrastructure. Um, so places, we're, we're struggling right now. We're in the middle of thinking how to handle our infrastructure to handle more water, um, to do these kind of things and offset and store water other places, keep it from, from running down and, 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 and going straight into estuaries, but, but also just keep it off roads and destroying infrastructure that we already have in place. So um, anything that, that, that does some of these things also potentially puts us in a, a, a potential, because I think it's a very real potential in Florida to have too much water. Um, and so I, I would tend to think any of these things would be good. And I, I can't say enough, the localized ability, the ability to be surgical and tactical in what we're doing to, to go after specific areas uh, and realizing those will have specific effects only for that one area are so, are so important. So if we can be diversified and use more carrots, I think that's something that we would totally be supportive of and find in a way to work with the state in a partnership. I just a quick quick jump in. I, I made a note earlier, didn't come up, but uh, your your comment picked on it. There are really two seasons of Florida relative to water. There's the season where we have too much, and there's the season where we don't have enough. 
Uh, that was an excellent point. Um, I, I'll only add uh, one thing to this, and, and David, I can't remember whether you you dared me to mention water quality credit trading or whether you threatened me not to, but. Um, uh, you know, one of the challenges to distributed water storage is is identifying long-term funding. Um, you know, theoretically, if if uh, if you're going to want to compensate a landowner to store water on their property, uh, you know, you might want to be able to to ensure that landowner that whatever investment that they've got to to put in the infrastructure to do that, and whatever uh, that does to their normal ag agriculture practices, that you know, that there's some certainty there, or I think there's, there's gonna be uh, not a lot of willing volunteers. So, so one thing that I see as a, as a real uh, potential uh, problem solver out there on the horizon is, that was done last year by the legislature was uh, expanding the water quality credit trading uh, uh, laws statewide. And so what this could potentially do, we were talking about septic tanks before, and uh, you know, Commissioner mentioned that, that it isn't as big a deal in Escambia as it is in, in other parts of the state. See, I think we need to deal with whatever uh, uh, the sources of nutrients are, you know, whatever, wherever they are, whatever they are, we need to provide the, the tools and mechanisms and funding opportunities to, to deal with those problems. And sometimes they're gonna be septic tanks and sometimes they're gonna be agriculture and sometimes there's, there's gonna be other sources as well. And um, uh, we need to, to create enough regulatory flexibility so it can be solved at the local level. And the obligation to, to clean those nutrient sources up uh, needs to be left at that local stakeholder level. And right now, that's the state of regulations in Florida is when there's an impaired water body, the watershed that contributes to that water body are all assigned some load allocation. They all, they've all got a burden to, to make some improvements. And, and when, when the state comes in and, and wants to connect a bunch of people from septic, well, that might not be the best bang for the, uh, for the, for the buck for that impaired water body. Maybe it's in an area like Escambia County where it would be a lot more cost effective if you retrofitted a lot of municipal stormwater uh, to, to, to treat that, that stormwater that goes into the bay. Or it might be an agriculture uh, issue. But, but to tie this back to distributed water storage and, uh, and water quality credit trading is, is again, letting market forces do what mar the market is gonna do, and that is, uh, it's going to reward the most innovative idea. It's going to re reward the most cost-effective solution. And so in some parts of the state, uh, uh, the most cost-effective solution for nutrient abatement might be to pay farmers not to farm and instead to store water on their property. And, and that there's a nutrient abatement uh, uh, effect of that water storage as well. If you if you receive water that might be impaired or might be from from uh, from other land uses where the where the runoff uh, has nutrients, and and the funding source might not be the taxpayer. It might be a municipality or a county or another entity that has an obligation to reduce their nutrient load. So instead of paying. I'm just gonna throw a number. Instead of paying $100 per, per pound per year to get nutrients out of the water, you might write a check to a farmer to, to get 50 pounds per year of, of nutrients out of the water. Uh, I'm sorry, at $50 per pound per year of nutrients out of the water. And, and, I'll, and, and, and just having the, step, the state kind of have, have, uh, have the willingness to kind of step out of that relationship, not want to be in the middle of it, that transaction, not want to over-regulate that transaction so that it can never occur. I mean, that's what, that's what the state needs to do is, is um, facilitate a marketplace like that and then let that marketplace of ideas drive the solutions that have the lowest cost uh, uh, to, to the forefront. And, and the state can, can facilitate that not only by creating the regulatory environment to do that, but also by perhaps seed money. And so I like, I like the idea that the legislature continues to, uh, to set aside some money for water quality projects. I think the way it's been done the last couple of years has been very effective because it puts the, the, uh, the identity of those projects in the hands of local government, bringing them, working with the water management districts, that's a, it's, it's a much more local level of, of uh, problem solving than if it was a top-down Tallahassee approach. And then those water management districts and those local governments, um, they can leverage different sources of money to get more done. So David was saying uh, $100 million worth of springs restoration projects with, a, with $20 million from the legislature. That's a, that's a fantastic 
uh, result, and that can continue to be the result with the right kind of balance and uh, kit, uh, carrots and sticks. Okay, I had a question from the audience. I just have heard, heard fertilizer come up in the, the discussion that um, you know, we had legislation that, that seems like every session something's filed. So the science, I guess, gets lost sometimes in the debate for the very bright people where you know, we fought for local control for counties uh, and cities to be able to regulate I want to duck under the table. I'm going to uh, take the shot at it. I'll my... I'd rather my president not answer <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, this is, uh, I'm not sure. I'll come in after. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please save me at any point. You're just hold on to my microphone and switch to mute at the appropriate time. Um, I'll answer it this way. It, it, it's, it's intellectually inconsistent to, to use the argument with EPA that the federal government can't know more than Florida in, a, in assessing its own water quality challenges and, and deriving its own water quality solutions. And if that's true, and I believe that it is, then it's intellectually consistent to, 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 uh, to let a local government solve its, you know, solve its own problems. So I, I personally, uh, and I'm probably way out on a limb on this, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in favor of a state down you know, state-led, top-down approach to um, uh, to fertilizer ordinances or fertilizer, you know, bans of fertilizer ordinances. I think if, if the state is going to impose a regulatory burden on a, on a county to clean up its waters at, at whatever cost, uh, and those regulatory sticks are in place to do that, uh, then to take away a potential solution uh, just seems uh, inconsistent. How bad was that? No, it's good. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add a, add a point on that, is that uh, it goes back to this idea of what are the issues that are being addressed in that particular community based upon the, the geology, the geography, the, the hydrology of the particular area. Uh, in certain places, um, fertilizer applied to lawns is causing problems. In certain places, it's not. Um, in certain places, you have excess fertilizer in a system that's been there for years. You have legacy phosphorus north of Lake Okeechobee. Um, so I go with Jeff and say, listen, there needs to be an ability for a local government to have reasonable programs. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on this comment. When I talk about reasonable programs, I like more carrots than sticks. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is the market has also been changing, particularly in the residential fertilizer business, is that the market is starting to react not only to regulation but to consumer demand uh, and consumers being educated on too much phosphorus. Uh, and so if you look at your Home Depots today and your Lowe's, if you look at the blends that are in there, most of them don't have phosphorus anymore in the state of Florida. And I look at it and say, yeah, is that because of bans? Yes, maybe. Is that because of market? Yes, maybe. Is it because of education? Yes, maybe. Is it because of all of the above? Absolutely. And so I, as, as I look forward to developing policy and, and thinking about how do we create our water future in Florida, we need to, we need to look at these issues together uh, and determine in, in this particular area, what are the contributing factors to water quality problems? Okay, fine, we've identified them. Now, what are the contributing solutions to solving those problems? Um, and I think uh, human beings, it's human nature, we wanna blame one person or one industry. And the reality is, it's all of us. So you know what? It's gonna take everybody to solve it. The, the, the only thing I want to comment on a little bit in some of the things you were talking about earlier in the local government, I think, I think we want to find a way to be a partner with the state, and I think locals want to find that opportunity. What we don't want, though, is then the unfunded mandate that comes to us. So I think you, you were very uh, clear up front that you said some of this stuff is going to have to have funding or else it won't work, and we would totally echo that. The other question I have slightly uh, to what you were saying, uh, certainly here, if we go east or we come south in Florida, it's easy because it's all, when the water falls, it's all within the state of Florida. But in my neck of the woods, my region, 
um, Pensacola Bay, my district is all along Pensacola Bay estuary, 60% of the watershed uh, that rain falls, it falls in another state. It falls in Alabama. So my question is, I don't mind being responsible for what I do, but how do I become responsible for what another state? And this gets back to the issue you were, we started on the Apalachicola and where do we sit? And I totally agree with you. Those are things that the federal government was devised to take care of, but they're not taking care of. But um, how do we deal with that issue? Because that's the one thing that scares me is I, I, don't, I want to be great on what I do, but I can't be great on the water that comes to me. Well, at, at the department, uh, I'll, just, I'll just describe very briefly what the, what the regulation says and then whether it's carried out faithfully or, and whether you believe it was, it was done appropriately in, in your case is another matter. But you shouldn't, you're not going to get a load allocation or a burden on reducing pollutants for, for waters that you can't control. In other words, the entire basin is mapped out by the, by, the, by the agency, by DEP in this case, and all the contributing land masses are all determined, uh, are, are, are all uh, assessed to determine uh, to what extent they contribute to the overall problem, and then the load allocation is assigned by the land mass. And that's, that's the case whether it's crossing a state line or not. So you're not receiving the entire burden of the watershed just because you're the, you're the only thing that, that Florida DEP can, can latch its regulatory teeth into. Uh, uh, so back of the napkin, if you've got 25% of the watershed and 75% of it is in, is in Alabama, then you should get 25% of the burden. And, and what that means, unfortunately, for Scambia Bay is it, unless Alabama is an effective partner and that's a big if, but that's something that, that, that the department works on its relationship with its neighbors, its, its, its neighbors and, uh, in, in our corresponding regulatory agencies. And uh, Secretary Vineyard and I, we met with our counterparts in Georgia and we met with our counterparts in Alabama and all the other southeastern states quarterly. So these are things that come up. And uh, you know, what, what they're challenged by in Alabama is, is, uh, is less funding you know, and, uh, and a less robust agency with not the level of science and, and expertise that we have here in Florida. So they're playing catch up. Um, so that, that's, that's the answer. Okay, and I, uh, oh, well, I was just gonna respond. I didn't hear anybody mention agriculture um, in the response to agricultural fertilizer use. Uh, you know, I think the best way to answer that, that question is to go tour some Florida facilities. It is, it is really remarkable the level of efficiency in both irrigation and fertilizer use that we have in this state. We are really, I think we're, we're, we're light years ahead of many other regions of this country. We have best management practices that are, that are implemented. Uh, I toured a dairy facility recently that has, was, was nearly closed loop. It had used the manure to fertilize the corn that was used to feed the the cows, I mean, it was really remarkable. It was really a sophisticated operation. So, you know, I think we've, we've done a lot in this state uh, for that issue. And I guess the, you know, to maybe play the devil's advocate on the, the urban fertilizer use, you know, there are some real complicating factors there as well. You know, if you look at, you know, requirements about what kind of fertilizer you can sell in a community, you know, you want to limit phosphorus or, or nitrates or something like that. Well, you know, what if, one local government has adopted that, but the one next door hasn't. Is that going to be effective? Uh, what if uh, um, the producers of the fertilizer, you know, will they have the economies of scale to deal with various different types of fertilizer ordinances? You know, are we, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze really when, when you get down to the impacts on, on local industry and, and the environmental benefit you'll, you'll get from it? So, you know, some of these issues when you start really looking into them and the question is, how is it going to work? You know, that's always the question that I try to ask myself anytime I'm reviewing a, a bill or any other policies. You know, how's this really going to work? Um, so there are some some complicating factors there. I, there's a question in the back. Yes.
But, you know, I see people around the table with good ideas, but then they ask about the funding of it. So um, I think everybody's for this local solution and convening people around the table to come up with a solution. But I'm not quite sure on the funding stream because there seems to be a pretty significant amount of money coming from philanthropy, but heavy on the conservation side, which sometimes doesn't appeal as much to business. So do you all have examples of funding models once it if it could get to this local level with local solutions, would it be allocated? But there's a big question of like, okay, here's a great idea, but how do we fund it? Things as basic as a study and what's the real economic impact on our region based on these issues. And that seems to always be the sticking point. So what about the funding? And philosophically, we all get an agreement around this local solution. Our municipalities don't have the money to fund these kind of big projects. We had this. We had this. Dis we had this discussion in the last one. I think you were there asking us, and I came to your came up to you and said, "Hey, com community foundations, which you're talking about specifically, what you are, if I remember, this is a great thing for them to help us with these kind of issues like that because we don't have any funding for research. If you talk about what ph philanthropy could do." The issue is we need something like that that is also, there are a lot of foundations. Some foundations have goals that they want to set and so if it becomes, it becomes skewed, I think you need somebody more neutral uh, like that would, that would be where a community foundation certainly could work because I think to some extent um, there are foundations out there but sometimes they're a little bit biased in either way. You're looking for somebody to be neutral. I think that is one place that community uh, philanthropy could be important because I know you brought up that question in the last meeting. I think it would be valuable in helping us understand some of these things. We don't have money for research. We really don't at, local, at the local level. Um, so that, that, that's, that's something that, that we could certainly use. Okay, I see a, a lot of questions stacking up. Sorry, I think the first one was Secretary Soul. I have a question. I want to go back to the, the comment One of the things that I applaud more and more in the legislature is how we developed this strategy to, to address it. I think the frustration includes the issue of understanding what's impacting the resources, the length of time it takes to get a payment done, and the resources available to get it acknowledged. We see a lot of frustration across the state because everyone acknowledges the problem, but it's just not a list. How do we address that issue? Because you look at the legislative structure that's been provided, the flexibility of water quality credit trading, things of that nature. I think Florida is really on a great path. But now we have this kind of choke uh, or bottleneck on getting things done because it really is very place-based. You know, the things the commissioner you raised and making sure it's, it's based upon what these folks in this region understand and need. But it's just the volume of things picking us, picking us in the tail, being able to get them accomplished. How do we address that? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, well, I, th I, think, I think you'll see, if you look historically at the rate of BMAP production, you'll see that it has picked up significantly over the last few years, and, and that's because there's been a real priority. There's been an acknowledgement that there's a choke point. Once a water body is, is deemed impaired, there, there has historically been a pretty lengthy delay before uh, uh, even the next step of assembling stakeholders and starting to address the science and starting to identify potential solutions. That, 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 that length of time definitely needs to be compressed. Uh, the department has recently uh, reached out to uh, uh, non-government entities and even the private sector to bring the science to the department that it doesn't all have to be uh, you know one flavor of science or it, it doesn't it, can't, it doesn't necessarily just need to be a DEP scientist that's that's behind the the uh, the science in a particular BMAP and then and then something that I'm pretty excited about is is there's a lot more discussion uh, this is this is more even more recently with the water management districts and leveraging some of the the, the science resources the significant uh, scientific resources that are in uh, the, in the water management districts, particularly the big three, uh, and and if if uh, if the department were able to leverage its own internal resources with those of water management districts and those of uh, of, of external entities, be they non-government organizations, not profits, or whatever, or or, or privately funded science, I think uh, I think we would see the benefit of of accelerated BMAP production. The I think the the uh, 
the most difficult aspect of, of BMAP development is the science. It's ensuring that we identify the right contributors and, and also the right uh, potential solutions. Okay, yes, question here we go. And just a comment to the person in the back on the foundation funding. Um, Ten years ago, Martin County passed a five-year sales tax. We took our $75 million that we raised in that period of time and matched it up to $350 million in terms of land acquisition concern. We weren't going to wait for the state. We weren't going to wait for the federal government. We were going to take it upon ourselves to do what we wanted to do in Martin County. Right, yeah, um, okay, go ahead, yes. Just, and I know we're about to run out of time. Uh, great, great discussion with, with these folks today, but uh, particularly with, with Representative Caldwell here. There, there's an interesting dynamic that has happened before. If you go back and look at the original Preservation 2000 initiative, the first time Florida as a state said, we're gonna put money into buying conservation lands. Um, one of the things that went with that was a series of local referenda. Um, some counties put it into their, their one time, some people, Lee County did a program that funded itself year in, year out. Um, and what was interesting about those programs is you took the campaign for the state's gonna make a commitment, now the local government's gonna take a commitment and we're gonna go look for matching funds. Um, I'll go out on a limb here and, and, and say it, and I, I said it at a chamber conference a, a number of months ago, um, a political one is, guys, I'm, first I, I'll, I'll admit, the constitutional lawyer in me says putting it in the Constitution is a horrible idea. Um, the person who loves Florida says we've got to come up with a funding source to deal with these issues. Um, and so I'm supporting it. Uh, and then I'll give you a very simple one. It's polling at 75%. It's going to pass. So now we have an opportunity to say, you know what? We're going to take some real leadership steps and we're gonna create a system that provides for incentives for communities to come up with solutions. And you know what, if you come up with your solution faster than others and funds are available, you get to go first. And we start to create a market system that's based upon the more matches you have, the better your priority. Uh, the better your science is that supports your outcomes, the better your priority. Uh, the more you're working together with the local government, the water management district, your utilities, uh, your utilities who are providing water, guess what? The more people you've got at the table, you're higher your funding source. And to provide within this system of funding some flexibility so that in a particular year, if we have six hurricanes and the state is drowning in water, you know what? The legislature can say, you know what? We're sending a bunch of money to deal with that problem this year. You know what, four years later, you may be in an intense drought, and we're gonna send money that way. If you looked at this as a 20-year plan and said, we're now gonna enact a funding source that's gonna go 20 years. And if you look at the broad-based item and say, okay, now let's match that funding source with good policy, let's match that funding source with private funding, the market, let's match that funding source with federal funding that's coming to Florida anyway, and let's create a system that gives us enough flexibility so that you're not telling one county to do something that doesn't work in their area. So I look at this, and I, I know we're gonna drop into a, into a cocktail party. Guys, there's a great opportunity here to take a leadership role where the business community, the conservation community, the, the folks that are interested in all kinds of things can work together 
to make some really significant strides forward in the state. And that's going to take a lot of, it's not going to be easy, but over the course of the next number of months and through the session, I, I look forward to a really robust debate from all different perspectives and hopefully we can come up with something that actually makes a difference and moves the ball forward. Okay, uh, Kathleen's been waiting patiently here. Right. I, th I think uh, this is going to sound really simplistic, but I think it's the easiest way to answer it. So we've got a Clean Water Act. It says that waters have to be healthy enough for their designated uses. And so in Florida, um, uh, with few exceptions, waters have to be fishable and swimmable. So, so that's, that's the target. Any water that isn't meeting that is identified as impaired eventually. Um, that, that sometimes takes some time, uh, but, but every water body that isn't meeting that designated use is, is uh, designated as impaired, and then the science gets invested into, this, into the solutions necessary to bring it back into attainment. So, so that's what we're looking for. That's what we're asking. In, it, it, when, when the department imposes a regulatory burden on a, on, a, on a stakeholder in a basin that has an impaired water in it, they're asking everybody to pull their, their share to get that water body back into, into healthy. Uh, attain, you know, and, uh, attain a healthy status. Okay. I, I would say real quickly, the Restore Act envisions a lot of what you were talking about, and, and the issue was what I was very concerned about at first. Everybody was running out and they were thinking projects. I don't think that does us very good just to throw out projects. Everybody wants to throw out what they haven't been able to fund and just go get stuff done, but that's not what it's about. The idea of what the Treasury rules have come out and said, and I think what's good for these multi-year implementation plans in all three in, in 23 individual counties and the state expenditure plan that we're going to do that overarches across the entire state is we've got to come up with what does restoration mean. And I agree. I mean, for me, Pensacola Bay, it's a, it's a water system that is flourishing. It's seagrass is growing. I've got fish living in it. I'm able to, to put together an estuary that is actually living and improving, and its water quality standards are going up. That's the idea of what restoration is. Now, the hard part is how do I get there? But at least if I know what I want my goal to be, that's what we should be saying is what is the goal first and then the goal will lead you to the projects that will get there but don't just throw projects up there because we have the ability to, to, to waste money on things that don't actually accomplish it because I agree with what you said you said uh, you know something may work better here it's 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 what helps you get to that overall end goal which is which is the those are the projects you should pursue and, and they should have to define themselves in that way so you have to define what it is you want you want each water body to be and I mean obviously for me right now I mean I think about the greater Pensacola Bay system and clearly what I want to see is seagrass coming back uh, fish coming back those kind of things that we want to uh, we want to see a healthy estuary and I'll uh, kind of as a closing thought here you know all this discussion I want to make clear at least my opinion is I think we've got great reason for optimism in this state if you look at our track record and what we've done here as a state with taking such an influx, an influx of people over the past 30 years and what we've done at the same time to restore water bodies look at Tampa Bay that is really a crowning achievement where we have more seagrass in Tampa Bay now than we did in the 1950s. Just think about that. So absolutely, Floridians have a history of stepping up to the plate and addressing challenges when they're before us. But I'll also give you a little word of caution as well. It took a while for Tampa Bay, after the projects were put in place, for the system to respond. So I think particularly in this day of uh, Twitter and uh, all those other, you know, uh, instant kind of gratification uh, tools we all carry around in our in our pockets it's gonna take time to where even if we do exactly the right thing in all these areas it's gonna take time for systems to respond that's okay that's that's you know that's that's the way it is I think we've got good science-based programs in the state and, and you know I think that we're gonna be able to get uh, from here to there to where in 2030 we're not gonna be saying what it could have should have we'll really be saying man we have done the right thing as a state. So thank you. I'll let everybody get to their cocktails. And uh, thank you, panelists.